Welcome to the great conversation where ideas matter, ideas shape markets, ideas can change the world. As you all know, I am absolutely intentional seeking out leaders in the marketplace who can inform us, infuse us um, on how to live a life of purpose. And um, I have great friends out there who've been on this podcast, like Mark Oakes, the CEO of Concentric. Uh, I just got off the phone with Tom Mayer, uh, who uh, does an amazing uh, amount of work uh, around uh, the intersection of how your deep needs intersect with your deep joy. I um, was with an HR director the other day who's absolutely intentional on being more than just an HR benefits person, but actually creates organizational strength in what she does. And I uh, ran across a gentleman who appears to have many balls in the air. He's an author, he is a entrepreneur, he's a consultant, a coach, an advisor, but more importantly, I think, the reason I want him on this podcast is to explore what I've been calling the path to value, but through his eyes and through his great work. So welcome to um, the, I think you're the CEO of Next Level, um, Next Level, what was that again, Tony? Next Level what? Next level insights group. It's it's a it's a it's a smaller organization organization, but yeah, I'm probably best known for my role as chairman of of a large logistics software company called called Dovetail. Well, and then of course you assembled Advise, which is kind of your playground for lots of ideas and getting those into right. the marketplace, right? Right. So this yeah, is Tony. Quite, so this is it. so this is Tony Davis, all the way from Johannesburg sitting in his office over his garden and I'm in my garden. So Tony, welcome. Thank you, Ron. It's, it's really a privilege to be with you today. I, um, I'm just so excited. I really am because you've manifested what you are preaching out there. You've manifested power, purpose, passion. Uh, you seek it out. You're interested in um, the, the science behind it, the intersection between the life, left and right brain. You've, you, you're a prolific reader. Uh, he just showed me a book that he's currently reading from Harvard Business Review. Um, uh, and so what I would like to explore, I have a methodology for how I come along my clients and I call it the path to value. And it starts with the mind of the owner. You'll catch this in a second why I start there, the mind of the owner. Then the mind of the market, the transactions of value going within the garden his business is in, the mind of the market, the transactions of value, the mind of the investor where the new money is going, running after the new stuff that will possibly disrupt that market. Right. And, then, and then, of course, the mind of the company, the client itself, what are they doing with the tools they have? the blessings they've been given, what are they right. doing with it in their garden today? And how do we either make it more efficient or how do we totally disrupt it to go after what is the promise to tomorrow? Now, in a nutshell, everyone, you just heard the path to value from Ron Warman. But if you study Tony, he has a path to value too. Tony, can you walk me through how somebody, back to the mind of the owner, how somebody taps in to how they were uniquely designed so they can be a better leader in their garden. Yeah, Ron, thanks very much. That's that's a great place. And, and you know, it always does start with the mind of the owner. You're, you're 100% right. I think um, Jim Ron wrote a great book called the, the Five Major Pieces to the Life Puzzle. Great book. In my top five books of, of all times reading, and he he says everything starts with your philosophy, then your attitude, then your actions, which leads to results, which leads to lifestyle. And he says most people just want to jump to lifestyle. But it all first starts with philosophy. Um, and if you don't have your philosophy right, everything else goes wrong. So I think with my path to value as an individual, I'm always 
using the word purpose and and we used to do seminars and say everything had a p so there was power purpose passion principles you know purgatory i don't know or we had all sorts of fun stuff <laughs> i'll explain that in a second but for me i always look at um you you got to understand what your purpose is wrong we were we were talking about just now how do you keep all these balls in the air how do you work on different things and and it's all to do with for me it's all to do with what what you prioritize time is everyone's got the same amount of time time is a matter of priorities so you, you will do the things that you prioritize so everyone says i wish i had more time you, you can't have more time but you can change your priorities and you can do the things that you want to do so in order to set your priorities i'm i'm really along the picture of so what is your purpose in life because when you're motivated with something look people call it flow when you're when you're in flow when you are doing what everybody goes where somebody goes that's just the time just flew by today for you it's doing things like having a conversation like this i can see it it's 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 just your passion and it's just fantastic you're really good at it so when you're doing that you're in your purpose your god given purpose what i'll call your god given purpose and i split that into three sections i'd say your first section is your is your financial or your career your professional whatever you want to call it that purpose the the second one is is your uh your ministry or your charity or your give back what what are you going to do to for other people without earning any money and then the third one is is what i call your your lifestyle which is or your pastimes you know and that could be family you know maybe you enjoy playing guitar or you like gardening or i don't know tinkering with motor cars or something i don't know whatever it is so those three th those are found on the intersection of two imagine two big circles and we sort of push them together where those two over over overlap one is your strengths or your powers as we call it, i call it and the other one is the things you love or your passions and and you've all seen models like this before i'm sure but where those two intersect that's where your purpose lies i mean you you might really love being a karaoke singer but being really bad at it you know this is this is not your purpose in life it doesn't mean you can't do it it just means it's not your purpose in life and then a lot of people find they're really strong at something you know i'm 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 good with with admin but i hate it right but i can do it if i need to do it right um i can be very pedantic about things but it's not something i enjoy doing so i just put it off and put it off so that's also not in my purpose i'm not going to be a great administrator um in life where those two circles intersect those are the three the three things your profession your pastime and and if you like your ministry let's take a third circle and put it on top so we we have a, a, where three intersect and that's your money circle where your money circle or your, or your profession circle where that intersects with your power and your and your passion that's where your profession is okay now the problem with with that is a lot of people start there it's something they love doing they're good at it and they're making money at it but what they do is they start chasing the money as opposed to developing what they should be doing and they they move out of the passion into the just where the other two circles intersect which is what i'm good at doing and what i'm making money at but i don't enjoy it and that's what i call purgatory or the rat race and ron we were talking about people saying at the end of their life you know the, the, thank god it's friday club right <laughs> I mean, that's a terrible thing. I mean, thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's the end of the week. It's the end of the month. It's the end of my life. Really? So I want to be, thank God it's Monday. Thank God it's Tuesday. Thank God it's Wednesday. Every single day is a great, is a great day to have. When you're in the rat race, it's thank God it's Friday. It's, it's how do I get through this lot so that I can retire on half of what I didn't have before. Right? So when people are in that rat race i'm always going get back into what you love even if it means losing some money for a while because ultimately if you're in where you love and you're good at you will excel and you'll love it and you'll love every minute and and we're at work for a long a good portion of our life let's take that bubble away let's put another bubble on and this one is if you like your uh, charity or your ministry or 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 whatever you you want to call that your give back your significance where that one intersects with again what you're good at and what you love doing that's your again what i call your ministry or your pursuit or your um your give back or or whatever and that's where that fits in and again you're not earning any money out of that if if you are earning money out of that means you're full time in 
in charity or you're maybe full-time ministry or you're you're working at a nonprofit or something like that. But even a nonprofit, you get paid, right? So that one there, and, and I'm assuming here that there's a need, right? I'm assuming that where, where there's there's money, somebody's going to pay you for that, whether it's your own business or or you're an employee, right? Um, and likewise with ministry, there's going to be a need somebody, and maybe there's some orphans or there's somebody needs assistance somewhere. And that's where that one fits in. And so that's your your ministry. Then your third one is your lifestyle. This is just for you. This isn't for anybody else. So this is inward. So this could be where your uh, family are. This could be, and it should be, uh, family is, a, is obviously a, a big one there, but it could also be your interests and your hobbies and so on like that. That's also a purpose in life. A lot of people get confused and they think I've got one purpose in life and I've got to be doing one thing. I've got to be Mother Teresa with one purpose. But even Mother Teresa had many, many purposes in life if you actually spoke to her. So uh, we have multiple purposes. We can have one big calling or one big thing. I, I get that. But most people have multiple purposes in life and they need to understand that. And in fact, if you think there is only one purpose in your life, Actually, many times you live a very unfulfilled life because you're always trying to find this elusive, what's my purpose? And actually, you can have a very, very unfulfilled life. You cannot make an impact because you're always going, well, it's not this. And so I won't put my back into that and I won't focus on this. And you can get very disillusioned. Um, so actually, we have multiple purposes. And that the one other thing which this whole thing sits on, and you talked about it with principles, th these are your core values. As, as maybe Jim Rohn, Jim Rohn used to say, your philosophy. What do you believe? And there's some, there's a, some great teaching by guys like Andy Stanley on, on how to get to that point. Um, but you should have, I don't know, five odd, maybe seven key values in life that you go, I'm, I, you know, maybe God's first in my life and my, my family are key and I'm not going to ever destroy that relationship. And I live a life of integrity and honesty and I do everything with fairness. And I don't know, whatever your values are, they're not one word. They should be a short sentence. Let's take ethics because that's a, that's a good one. Everybody, everybody says, no, I want to live a life of integrity. Okay. So let's just describe that in a sentence or two. What does that mean? I'm, I'm honest. I, I am a trustworthy person. I'm a person of integrity. I conduct all my affairs honestly. I, what is that? And you've got to describe that. And you've got to believe these and you've got to believe them with all your heart. And you do already. Everybody has a set of principles or values, even if they haven't enunciated them, they have them. Those things direct all your choices in life. John Maxwell said this many years ago. He said, he said, make your major decisions once and then learn to manage your decisions. Yeah, quick example, I, I, I decide I want to get fit. I'm going to go to gym and I'm going to go to gym at six o'clock in the morning. Let's just say that as an, as a, and that's my decision. <laughs> if every single morning at 5.30 when the alarm clock goes off, I go, oh, do I feel like going to gym today you haven't made a decision and now you've got to make it every single day. And every time you make a decision, that's stress and energy. And then you might choose not to do it because, well, actually you're asleep and it's cold outside and you don't want to do it. All right. Managing the decision says, no, I've got to get up at 5.30. Therefore, I'm going to go to bed at, earlier at this time. My gym bag is going to be ready. My clothes are going to be ready. I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to get dressed in that. And I'm going to go straight to the gym. And then at 5.30, when the alarm clock goes off, there's no decision to be made. You just have to get up and go because you've already managed the decision. Your beliefs, your principles, your philosophies in life are already wired into your brain, into the way you think, whether you know them or not. And then decision-making becomes easy. Hey, somebody's offering us a bribe at, at the work. We can land this contract. We just got to pay these guys this. If you've already decided you never do that, it's just, a, it's not a decision. You just go, we don't do that. Right? Oh, there's somebody over there and, and maybe there's, I can have an affair with them. No, I'm, I'm a family man. I don't do that. It's just, it's not a decision. It's, there's no decision because you've already made a decision. So those are your principles and everything sits on top of that. And your purpose sits on that. Well, what's really fascinating about everything you just talked about is probably, um, the how, because anybody can talk about principles. Anyone can talk about passions and purpose. Right. There's plenty of aphorisms around there. There's 
plenty of authors that you can quote day in and day out, but you did something really unique just a few moments ago. You said you believe in God. Write down a yeah. sentence what that means. And then I, I created another column just on my own. <laughs> if you didn't mind telling me, I, I put another column and go, now give me examples of how that's played out. Right. Uh, and family, integrity. Um, so you're asking them to describe it. And yeah. you're probably, knowing you, you're watching their body language as they do so. Because we know actions will speak much louder than words. And uh, so getting people to really be honest with the core values that are maybe aspirational, but not yet quite lived. And then the next step you ask them to do is, okay, you want to have that value, but you're not living it. How do we create a habit? How do we repeat something over time until it's hard hardwired into our brain, our synopsis, so that it's no longer a choice? Yeah, did I get that right? Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely spot on, Ron. I, I, you know, to get to get to the point where you get your values is is a bunch of exercises you can do to do that. But to get to that one sentence is normally well. I, I do it with with the one group of guys. We, it took us the better part of seven hours for them to get their six, well, five to seven values, right? Because we do an exercise and you actually go, so, so what do I really believe? Let me give you a quick example. You know, you, you meet somebody and they go, no, I love making money. But internally they're thinking, I oh, know rich people are evil or rich people are greedy or rich people have done something. That's, the, that's, that's what's going on in their head. But they go, no, no, I want to make money. They'll just self-sabotage every time they have a great business idea or something comes along, they'll do something to self-sabotage because the internal belief isn't there. So you, to get to your values, you need to actually understand what your real values are, what your core beliefs are. This can't just be aspirational. It needs to be real. If you don't like them, then the wonderful thing about it is this, it's philosophy. It's your thinking and you can change your thinking. Right. Mark Oaks talks about this a lot, the plasticity of the brain and the ability to be able to change that. So you can do that. You can read, you can learn. Your, your belief system is based on what you've read, what you've experienced, and, and what, what's happened in your life forms your, your world belief. That's, that's what it is. Whatever you base that on, whether you base that on, I don't know, the Bible, or you base it on reading different philosophy books, whatever it is, you've somewhere along the line, you've created a self-philosophy. If you don't like something, and let's go back to that example, you say, oh, you know what? I, you're right. I'm jealous of all the rich people. I think they're all bad. Well, okay, let's go and change that belief. How do you do that? Well, you could read stuff, but let's go and meet some people. Let's go and meet some you know, philanthropists. And, um, oh, <laughs> philanthropists, sorry, I always think about philanthropreneur because I, I, I like to create businesses which generate cash for for nonprofits and so on, as opposed to just give them. Yeah, you know? so it's it's ongoing, sustainable. So for philanthropists, go and spend spend some time with philanthropists. See how they tick, and after a while, you'll go, "Wow, I had a wrong belief." You know, we can sincerely believe something, but we can be sincerely wrong, right? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> so we can change that, uh, and part of, as you say, part of that those beliefs is what does that look like? Mm. And it's the one thing when, when I, I, I work with people and, and they go, well, I want to do this. And I go, well, what does that look like? What's that end picture look like? Because the more you crystallize it, the more you can go, yep, I can see that. And you're excited about it. Then, you, then you, you, you'll hit your goal. So the path that we're trying to teach out there is, um, is about the path to value then absolutely is a journey in seeing and there's many tools if you're doing a business what you'd be recommending is you actually have a conversation with the marketplace you don't of course sit sit in your room with a lot of assumptions and if you're trying to create a relationship with somebody outside of business that probably bs be best not to assume anything but to actually right. have a sense of inquiry and empathy until you fully understand them. Yep. And now you know, no, that, now, and now you know how to serve them, which is the basis of any relationship. Let me ask you a question though. This, 
if you you said something, I can be sincerely wrong in what I see. Uh, there was a great book uh, that I'm still in the midst of because it's so voluminous. <laughs> and he speaks above my my diction my my dictionary half the time. I'm looking up words all the time because he's science and philosophy and everything else. And it's about the right and left brain. And it's really interesting because he paints a picture of the left brain being very utilitarian. It's a very useful part of the brain because it can take the, the right brain's scene of the whole picture and then begin to execute it. It's the emissary, if you will, for the master. Right. And yet um, what this author says is over time, somehow we've devolved into making the left brain the master. And I, I think these people who are living lives of quiet desperation, if you will, to quote Emerson, these people you run into who haven't taken the inventory of principles and core values and have simply begun to be utilitarian in their life. I'm checking out the box. I go to college, find a girl, settle down, get married, get a cocker spaniel, get a white fence, go to work. I don't really want to get up on Monday. It's almost like they're checking off boxes and they haven't ever been taught how to see. Am I, does, does that feel right to you? Yeah, very much so. Um, and, and I do think some people are, are more left brain oriented or more right brain oriented. Um, and uh, you see that a lot in the workplace um, and, and in life, actually, and, and the way they work. And some people talk about personality types and so on, but the brain works very well. Um, and, and I think what happens is we, we do tend to rely more on that left brain from a perspective of, let me give you an example. You know, when, you, when you're young, you say to a, um, uh, a young kid, maybe they're six or they're eight, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? And they're like, I want to be a fireman <laughs> or something, you know, uh, and they, they've got this picture which they've, they've created out of some desire or something. They're, they're like, if I ask that to, to you as an adult, you know, so what do you want to be when you, when you grow up? You'll go, I want to be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer or a, something like that or an entrepreneur. And we immediately sort of flip into um, a work role, a professional role. How about I want to be a great husband? I, I want to be a, a great dad. I want to be remembered as, as, uh, as a terrific grandparent. Um, I want to be remembered in my community as a person who made a, a significant amount of impact. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that as we get older, we're told, yeah, Ron, don't be stupid. You can't, you can't do that. You, you need to buckle down. You need to get real. You know, you finish school now, you need to go to university or you need to go to college or you need to get a job and you need to. And we, I think society and, and we, we all have to earn a living. It pushes us into that left brain thinking. And so what happens is we then get pushed into that, as you say, the tick box of, have I done this? Have I accomplished that? Because the world expects you, they judge you by, or you feel that they're judging you by, well, have I got the car? Have I got the house? Have I got the tick, 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 right? Which is what you're talking about. And I think society pushes us a lot into that. And I think that's changing. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, the, the more, um, millennial and other thinking is, is like, well, okay, maybe there's a little bit more to life than just those tick boxes, but sometimes they just end up with a different set of tick boxes. So I think it's not always necessarily left or right. I think it is a lot of it is just, well, we need to get this done. And then that creates my status for me. And, and unfortunately, all too often, you, you're, you're quite senior before you realize that a lot of that just didn't matter. <laughs> It just doesn't matter. I, I do. I have a great exercise I do with 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 people, Ron, and uh, and uh, and it, it's not my exercise. It's been done by by many people, but it's a it's a great example. Is to say, imagine you're um, at your at your own funeral, and there's going to be four eulogies. Who, and you? So you you, you want a family member talking about you? What do you want them to say? There's a friend going to talk about your life. What do you want him to say or her to say? There's a professional person, somebody from work. What do you want them to say about your life? And there's somebody from your charity, your ministry, your giving life. And what do you want them to say about your life? Go and do that exercise. 
Go and write four eulogies about your life. Then look at those and then go, okay, so what's actually important to me? And coming out of that, you'll see two things. One, you'll find out what your real sort of values are, but the other ones, you'll find out what some of your aspirations are. And sometimes you'll find out that you're on the wrong path. And the earlier you can do that in life, the better. And I, I do that sort of like once every year, once every two years, because things change. And so I, I, I do that exercise a lot. That helps a lot with, with um, sorting out some of those tick lists and saying, what's the important things? Tony Davis, this has been a great conversation, but I'm going to end it repeating the two questions. What do you, I'm stopping there just for a second. What do you, in parentheses, want to be when you grow up? And that's future state, who are you today? And, and so I'm adding the who are you today? because yeah. you essentially have implied that throughout this conversation, but that want to be, what, a, what an incredible part of a sentence, right? Want to be. Be is a verb in this sense. It's an active, it's a dynamic, it's a flow. And you have given us some insights here into creating a process to deeply fulfill that want to be. I thank you for this great conversation. It was my pleasure, Ron. Thank you very much for having me on board.